our Friday's Escape to the Forest um, that we started once we all got kind of locked into our homes and started doing things online. Um, so there's a lot of resources that we've added to the Woodland Stewards page. Um, look at the resource tab. Um, there's a list there of kind of general things on the resource page. And then on the left-hand side, there are subcategories um, where we've tried to categorize some of the things that we've posted. And all of our webinars are listed there as well. Before we get started, probably most of us are old hands now at Zoom as we head into the winter here. Um, but we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we will get to those at the end of the presentation. So we'll go through the presentation and then when we get to the end of that, we'll work our way through your questions in the Q&A box. So for today, um, we're talking about spotted lanternfly, spotting the spot, a national and state update and sp on spotted lanternfly. Um, our main speaker is Amy Stone, OSU Extension Educator in Ag and Natural Resources and kind of our program coordinator for spotted lanternfly. Um, we have some additional experts that are going to help us answer questions um, at the end of the session. Um, we have Tom DeHaas, um, Erica Lyon, and Maria Smith. And when we get to the end of the session, we'll kind of hit more on each of those as we get into the questions. So with that, Amy, I will stop sharing and let you get started. All right. Okay, so are you seeing the presenter mode or are we good? Good to go. We're good. All right, great. Well, um, thank you for tuning in today. Um, I hope we have a lot of good discussion um, and I'm really excited about the panel um, at the end of the presentation to answer specific questions that you might have um, with some of uh, some really good resources and educators across the state. Um, so today we're going to kind of take a look at kind of a national and state update as it relates to the spotted lantern fly. It's kind of a, I guess, an apropos topic or um, session that we're doing um, on Friday the 13th. Um, when Kathy asked if I would give this presentation, I thought, oh, Friday the 13th would be a good day for that. Um, kind of goes along really with the whole year for 2020. Um, but this is a photo that I took uh, when we went to visit an infested area in Pennsylvania a few years ago. And so we're gonna go through and talk about the life cycle and biology um, and hopefully give you some, maybe some old news that you can hear again. Um, it's always a good refresher to hear things um, over. And then maybe some new um, information. In fact, I received a couple maps today, um, this morning from the Department of Agriculture. So something that um, nobody except Erica has seen. We know that this insect is a global um, visitor. And so it can move long distances, um, but we're finding that out here in the state um, and in the United States that it's moving within a state or maybe from state to state. And we're gonna kind of break that down and what people can do to try to reduce the amount of movement. And so the natural spread of this insect is, is not very far, um, but it's this um, artificial movement that really is um, problematic and causing some issues in, North, in the Northeastern part of the, the United States. And actually with, uh, uh, shipment of a dead adult um, on the west coast so it's moving great distances. Whether this is your first spotted lanternfly presentation or um, you're a regular um, as it relates to spotted lanternfly or other invasive species, I really hope it's, it's not your last um, and it's so important to stay updated. Um, I talked to Dave Atkins this morning with ODA and um, getting the latest information from the department. Um, but 
we could hang up the phone and there could be another um, suspect report to ODA or another fine, potential find. And so always staying up to date, learning what the latest and greatest information is about spat, spotted lanternfly and really other invasive species is so important. So what we want to do is to kind of engage and hopefully have you join the battle of the bug. Um, here on this um, sign, it says beat the bug. Um, I'm not sure we're going to be able to, to beat it um, into eradication. I mean, that's not feasible, uh, but we can manage this insect. Um, and we also kind of need to learn how to live with it. It's kind of a, a similar tag line to the gypsy moth. Um, and I've worked on that invasive species. So we're hoping that we're gonna be boots on the ground and eyes in the sky um, and helping. And so as this insect inched forward, uh, we actually kind of leaped forward um, right along the Ohio line. And with that leap, uh, there were a lot of people who were interested. And so here's some folks from Ohio State University that are playing some role in spotted lanternfly. And there's, there's probably um, more folks too that are getting involved on a regular basis. Um, but these are the three that are gonna join me um, at the end of the presentation to answer specific questions. And so I'm excited to have so many people who are interested um, and engaged with this invasive species here in Ohio. What we're gonna cover is what is the spotted lanternfly? Where is it at? Uh, why should you care about the spotted lanternfly? Why is it important? What can you do? And then end with the panel discussion with some question and answers. So we're gonna jump right in and talk about what is the spotted lanternfly. The spotted lanternfly has been in the news. And so, um, you know, as we hear those stories um, out of Pennsylvania early on, it kind of piqued our interest in Ohio. Um, so much that we went over to see it firsthand. And it seemed like every new news story there was and every new report of a, an additional state, um, again, interest was peaked and we really started kind of gearing up for what we knew would be its ultimate arrival here in Ohio. When we take a look at the life cycle, um, we're gonna kind of just begin um, just with this illustration that Penn State has. And we're gonna kind of start right now where this insect is um, in its current life cycle. And so for the most part, it's gonna be in the egg mass stage right now. So eggs that were um, laid earlier in the fall. Um, at this point, we haven't found an egg mass in Ohio, which is, which is good news. So we still need to be searching for that. Um, and lots of people are looking for that. Um, but we'll get into um, site specific situations in just a bit. But they'll be in that egg mass stage from now all through winter and into spring when we see the first hatch of those first instars, which typically is going to be in late April, May timeframe, depending on where you are in the state. Um, you can see those small instars are primarily black bodies with white spots. Um, and as they go from second instar to third instar, they're gonna get a little bit larger each time. And then finally at fourth instar, although the body looks similar um, in, in characteristic, um, the thing that changes is you'll notice that addition of red color. And we're gonna kind of go through that uh, more specifically with some photos in just a bit. At that fourth instar, it's actually gonna transform then into the adult which typically is gonna be um, out in the environment, um, July timeframe through right now um, as things are winding down. Um, they will not survive a hard freeze um, and hopefully those are gone um, since we've had some really cold temperatures here in Ohio. Um, egg laying typically begins in September you know, through October, November, and then maybe even into December if we would have a really warm fall season. There is one generation per year. And so um, I guess you can look at that as, as good news. We don't have multiple generations and populations building up um, extremely fast. 
So let's take a look. Uh, when we talk about the adults, they're very large, uh, one inch long, a half inch wide. Uh, they're actually very beautiful insects in their coloration. And so although, I mean, you've got those lines and, and, and spots on the wings, um, they can, in where they're just um, standing still right there, can blend in very well with um, branches and twigs and trunks. Um, it's not until they actually lift up those the, the four wings and you see really that bright abdomen that I'll show in just a bit. Um, but even though, I mean, they have really specific characteristics, uh, once you see that, um, there's really not a lot that could be confused when you have, you know, direct comparison. This photo is actually um, shared with me from Erica. Um, and you can see here, so it's turned over. Um, the abdomen is pretty swollen. And so this female have, has not laid eggs yet. And so they were able to capture her before that egg laying occurred, which is, which is good news. And the one thing that kind of sticks in my head after talking to Erica, who's from Jefferson County, where the first find um, of a population um, was is how how big they were and so you see them on, in photos on the screen up there and we describe the size to you um, but when you see it in person I mean they are really large plant hoppers. Females typically are a little bit larger than the males um, and so when you have um, at some point when you see them out in um, nature in your own county, in your own area, and you're seeing differences in size, that could be the male to female comparison. We have mentioned those uh, really color, colorful um, hind wings. Um, it advertises kind of a defense chemicals. And so it's to scare away other predators, birds and things. Um, and you see that when you know they're about to move. And so um, really that, that, that bright color really catches your eye. And they, they have that flashy display when they're disturbed. And so when we were in Pennsylvania taking photos, when you got up too close to them, um, they would kind of flash and, and have, um, you know, lift those wings so you can see that, that color underneath. They are um, described as really poor flyers, uh, which is good for us and good for the natural movement of this insect. Um, some people describe them as kind of having a fluttering flight. Um, we have um, observed later in the season uh, where they kind of group together in mass and sometimes we'll get caught up in kind of wind currents, which can move them a little bit further than what their natural spread would be. Um, if you see an insect um, on the bark, um, some people would describe it almost like moth-like. But when you take a look at it from a different angle, um, their wings, they hold them almost like tent-like, kind of in a triangular pattern. And so this really differentiates, um, you know, they are plant hoppers. They're not moths, they're not butterflies. Um, they're in that plant hopper um, group. Here's just a couple other photos, um, again, showing the differences when their wings are tight and together and when they open those wings up and you can see um, that colorful pattern. The other thing that I wanted to mention, um, and there's, we're going to talk a little bit about some research that's going on, uh, but listen to a researcher out of Pennsylvania last week, uh, and he was describing kind of their behavior um, as adults and how they kind of congregate up into something that's very tall. And so sometimes that could be a tree. Other times it could be a telephone pole like that's illustrated here where you could see them kind of collect. Um, also um, cell phone towers where they've seen kind of masses in, in those large tall um, structures. And so we're going to talk about what to see and, and how to train your eyes and what to look for. And so um, Dr. Baker mentioned, you know, if you're driving and, and have a lot of telephone poles, not that you want to drive and look at a telephone pole, but if somebody else is driving and you can look, um, looking for adults on those poles. Now, obviously, they're not feeding, but there's something in their behavior that gets them to go up in that direction. 
um, as they're trying to kind of move on in, and spread out their population. We know that, you know, once any invasive arrives and we really try to promote um, out looking for um, that particular pest, you know, sometimes when people see an insect, they think, oh gosh, that's gotta be it, right? Um, we've learned our lesson with emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle and those insects that um, sometimes people get commonly confused. Virginia has this wonderful um, kind of fact sheet or flyer that are possible lookalikes. And so when you compare it directly to spotted lanternfly, you think, oh no, they don't look anything alike. But think about being out in the field, um, doing some scouting work, and you see this insect maybe out of the corner of your eye that kind of draws your, you in or attention to it. And so sometimes um, people may see these other insects and think, oh gosh, is it spotted lanternfly? The best thing to do is to, you know, obviously take a photo, collect the insect if you can. You know, sometimes when you see it up close, then you're like, oh no, that's not spotted lanternfly. But if there's any question about what you're seeing, make sure that you get it to someone. And we'll talk kind of about the reporting uh, sequence or who you need to reach out to, um, to make sure that, that it either is or isn't spotted lanternfly and then how to uh, report what you're finding. So some of the common things, the ornate bell moth, the Atlantis webworm, tiger moth, um, oak tree hopper, really kind of that triangular pattern, um, its body shape, the buck moth and the leopard moth are things that could possibly be confused out in the field. So let's start out by talking about the feeding injury and why spotted lanternfly is such a problem. And so both the adults and the nymphs feed uh, by piercing, by using their piercing sucking mouth parts. And so they're drilling into those stems, the trunks, that tissue and removing sap from the plants themselves. They are stem feeders. And so you can find where multiple um, insects are gonna drill in um, and hire the population, you know, the more they're removing from that plant that ultimately can cause some decline in stress on the plant that they're feeding on. When they remove their mouth parts, often there's a little sap that will continue to run. Um, and so you can see that in the photo to the left. And then of course, a higher infestation um, that we see on the right where you'd have multiple adults feeding at once. Um, also, what we see with this kind of sap resin or that excrement that's left over is, so you've got the direct sap coming out of the plant from where that injury occurred. Uh, but as the insect is feeding, it's processing that sugar and its excrement or honeydew also can collect on trunks and branches. The secondary thing that we see once we have that collection is this black sooty mold. And so, People actually may see a collection of this when populations are on the rise, and it may be what kind of draws people in to look for more signs and symptoms of spotted lanternfly. Now, not all black sooty mold will be a response of spotted lanternfly, but it's something to kind of intrigue you or to get you in there closer looking to find out what's going on. Additionally, um, wasps and hornets, are going to be attracted to that sap and that honeydew. And in fact, in Pennsylvania, the person that first um, found um, the spotted lanternfly infestation didn't really find spotted lanternfly to begin with. They saw this um, large number of, of wasp and hornets congregating near the, the sooty mold and the sap that's running. And so again, if you're seeing high numbers of that activity, it doesn't necessarily mean spotted lanternfly, but it's obviously something that you'd wanna look into a little bit further. This is kind of one of my favorite photos um, in, a, in a sick way, right? Um, high populations, um, you'll notice where these insects are feeding in swarms, right? And so they're on the main trunk, they're not on the leaves, they're not on the fruit, um, and so 
Imagine though, going to your favorite apple orchard in the fall and being greeted with this. And so, um, yes, it can decline the overall health of the tree, uh, but it also is a nuisance in numbers. And so with that collection of honeydew then on the apples, um, it just can be really a disaster for people in the orchards and vineyards to have to deal with. Here's another photo um, with the spotted lanternfly feeding on grapevines. Again, not on the fruit, not on the leaves, but on the actual vines. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, why it's a big deal. And so the nuisance in numbers is, is definitely one thing that each one of us and maybe our home landscapes um, will eventually probably have to deal with. Uh, but then we also look at the overall health of the plant and ultimate decline and even death in some cases. And so they're not typically an outright killer, let's say like emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle, but they definitely with their feeding um, can cause issues that can cause uh, the plants to become stressed and, and some ultimately die over time. Just a quick, um, I kind of put these post-it notes throughout the, the presentation um, just to kind of remind me. So there was concern and there were kind of a, a rash of um, news, news articles, um, TV spots uh, that people were concerned for human health. And so the adults do not bite or sting um, humans or pets. And so you know, they're going to be feeding on plants um, and they can be in your space, but they're not going to, to bite or sting you. The other thing uh, that there was a concern about were that uh, there were some stories that spotted lanternfly adults were toxic to pets. Um, and all the work that's been done thus far uh, really doesn't show that that um, is true. The situation or situations that people were reporting were um, kind of dogs that were um, drawn into the insect. Um, they were curious. Um, some dogs began eating these insects in high numbers. And so um, there were some dogs that got sick, um, were taken to the vet. Um, but I think it was more, there's no really toxins that are associated with the insect, at least that we know of yet. Uh, but I guess if you eat too much of anything, right, sometimes you um, could get sick. And so I think the, the message that Penn State and other states are trying to communicate, especially to residents when population numbers are on the increase, you know, to watch your pets and make sure that they're not ingesting large numbers. Um, and if you can somehow kind of separate the insect from the pest, um, if your dog or cat is, is interested in eating them is really the best thing that could be done. So we're gonna jump back to the adults, um, but you know, just sharing those stories or that information that we learn as we go along. Um, so the adult insects um, are gonna appear late in the summer. And so they will continue to feed just like the nymphs did before them. They'll feed mate and then they'll begin laying eggs. So that next generation. And so this photo, um, again, is, is another one of my favorites um, because when you look at those insects, you think, gosh, those are, they're so beautiful, so bright, so easy to see. Uh, but if you look here, just at a glance, um, they can sometimes blend in really nicely. And so if you're taking the time to monitor or scout for spotted lanternfly, and we'll talk about that in a bit, uh, really kind of make sure that you get your head in and, and, and take a close look. It's not kind of a, a walk by, especially if you're new to the pest and kind of becoming familiar with that. So you can have, um, you know, single adults kind of feeding alone, uh, but often kind of grouping up. And then of course, like those photos where they were really in mass. The insects mate, and then they begin to lay eggs. And so, a female spotted lanternfly can typically lay between one to two egg masses in her lifetime. And each of those egg masses um, include 30 to 50 eggs. Once the eggs are laid um, in that photo, you could see they're kind of laid in, in rows or columns. Some people describe them as chains. 
she covers them with kind of a waxy coating. Um, it's a really clear coating to begin with, but as that coating um, ages or that egg mass ages, the coating cracks. And I'll kind of show that in a little bit. Um, you can see here the range um, and size of the egg mass um, is dependent on how many eggs are in there. Um, they can be about one to one and a half inches long in, or two to three fourths of an inch um, wide. Here in this photo that you're seeing now, you can see kind of that glossy, um, almost kind of cement-like um, covering on the egg mass, but you'll notice on the upper or the top of that egg mass, um, they weren't fully covered. And so you can see that some of the eggs are exposed. Um, again, they're gonna be in this stage all winter long. And so it's a great time to, uh, once the leaves have fallen off in areas, uh, to look for these egg masses and begin scouting for um, the indication of, of a reproducing population. If you're out scouting for egg masses, or maybe you've scouted for gypsy moth egg masses, uh, this is a great photo that just illustrates the, the two egg masses, um, a total of three egg masses, but gypsy moth and spotted lanternfly together. And you can see even with the two spotted lanternfly egg masses that are in this photo, there is a variation in coloring. So as that egg mass ages, the color of that covering will also age, similar to gypsy moth, how it becomes um, or gets lighter as the season progresses. So because we're going into that season, and that's what people are going to be looking for right now, um, I've got quite a few samples or, or photos of egg masses on different surfaces. Know that egg masses can be laid on any flat surface. So often, you know, we think this is a tree pest, so we're going to look on trees, uh, but anything flat um, is fair game for this insect. And so sometimes the egg masses, depending on the color of the bark, stands out and it's really obvious. Sometimes they blend right in. Um, and that's really the case here. Um, if you can see, there's three egg masses kind of in a, in a line um, laid on this particular twig. They do have an affinity to um, old rusty metal. And so um, it's shown here on this burn barrel or metal barrel uh, where you have a collection of egg masses at the base. And so if that barrel stays in place, those are just gonna hatch next year and the population will continue. If for some reason somebody moves that barrel, um, wherever that barrel ends up, when the eggs are hatching, you have a new population. And so we really need to be aware and be watching for that artificial movement. Eggs can also be laid on um, rail cars, um, on vehicles, on firewood, um, in nursery stock, um, campers. So anything that's outdoors um, when the adult female is laying eggs are fair game. And just the reminder, wherever that ends up being the following spring, you have a potential of a new infestation. And so you just really have to be aware if you're receiving things from Pennsylvania or other states that have a reproducing population, there are quarantines in place to try to stop this artificial movement, um, but really kind of take a look just to make sure um, that everybody's doing the right thing and egg masses um, you know, didn't slip through. Just to, to show you again, um, over time, how those egg masses kind of dries and, and crack. And so you can see um, same egg mass just taken at different points over the season. Um, and the other thing to point out is you can see um, not all the eggs were um, totally covered with that waxy kind of cement-like substance. And so you can see some, some eggs that are exposed there. And another photo, just a totally covered egg mass on the lower um, part of the photo, and then one that wasn't covered at all. Um, and you can also kind of see some of the, the holes. And so either there was um, nymphs that have exited from that egg mass, 
or there's the potential of parasitoids or predators that have gone in um, to try to, to manage that population um, on their own. Um, to really try to encourage people to look for egg masses, Pennsylvania has done a series of slides that kind of shows you a photo in nature of where egg masses are, and then kind of they highlight to really make that stand out. And so you may be thinking, well, gosh, I saw that one even without it being highlighted. Uh, but sometimes we just need to train our eyes to really kind of look. And so you can see a variety of egg masses, um, a number of egg masses here on the birch. Um, and when you lighten up that bark color, they really do stand out. So just trying to kind of have people look towards the size and the shape um, and what we're looking for when we talk about egg mass surveying. You can hear, see here some on this, these branches that were cut, standing out a little bit further. Um, here on this rusty metal with the adult still there um, and those two egg masses. And then finally, some egg mass or an egg mass on a picnic table. Um, and again, if that picnic table stays there, that egg mass is just gonna hatch in that already infested area. But if it gets moved for some reason, it's the potential for transportation and movement into a new area. Again, any flat surface. And so you can see here on the concrete, quite a few uh, collection of egg masses that are there. In the states that have high populations, they're encouraging residents to scrape and destroy egg masses. Uh, there's also some work on um, an oil that you would apply to the egg mass um, to kind of smother the, um, the eggs and then the nymphs won't hatch. Um, it is important that if you see egg masses and think, oh, I've got this, I'm gonna scrape them and destroy them. In Ohio, you need to report that egg mass first. And so photos, um, I mean, you could scrape and remove and we'll talk about the reporting uh, protocol, uh, but you know, if, if I'm, I've got you excited, you're gonna go looking for eggs. Um, if you see those egg masses, first make sure that you make that report to confirm that in, is indeed what it is. So those eggs that spent all winter long in that stage um, are gonna begin hatching end of April, beginning of May. Um, they go through those four instars or stages that we talked about in the diagram. The first three instars are black with white spots. Um, some people have described them as kind of tick looking to them, um, whatever kind of gets that description um, that makes that uh, you know, work for you. You can see here from going from one instar stage to another. And then finally the fourth instar or the final instar of the nymphs, um, you'll see that color pattern changes um, and you'll see not just the black with white, uh, but patches of red. So again, this is what we're gonna look for. Um, in this nymph stage, they have a pretty wide host range, both woody ornamentals, uh, perennials, herbaceous plants. And so um, they are just kind of seeking food, definitely have their favorites, but you'll, you'll see them People mentioned um, basil, um, some veggies in the garden. Um, so they have a pretty wide appetite as, as nymphs. And that kind of then kind of gets a little bit narrower as adults. And so when we talk about the spotted lantern fly, and this is primarily the adults, the preferred host is tree of heaven or ailanthus. And so this is an invasive plant that we want to actually rid um, ourselves of. Uh, but it can be a nice monitoring plant um, if you're going into areas that you're just um, revisiting, um, just making sure that you're monitoring and that we don't have spotted lantern fly. Additionally, they like grapes. Um, and so uh, Maria is our, our grape expert today and she'll um, answer those questions as they relate to the grapes. But they'll also feed on apples, other fruit trees and hops. And so um, it does have or can have an impact on feeding with crops that, that we're producing for purposes. So again, wide host range, both weed plants, herbaceous plants. Um, 
if you're interested in monitoring, we've kind of focused, and I know um, Thomas has done some videos along with Andrew Holden on identification of Alanthus and using those as, as monitoring plants. And so we're going to kind of give you a list of resources at the end uh, via email that can help you kind of be your toolbox of information as we kind of move forward. But just a couple things on Alanthus, if you're not familiar with um, the this particular invasive plant. Um, you know, at first when we knew that spotted lanternfly was drawn to or liked Alanthus, I kind of cheered and thought maybe it would be a biological control for Alanthus, but it's just not working out that way. Um, some people can confuse Alanthus with sumac, um, but what we're seeing up close is kind of a, a shrubby growth. Um, they grow very quickly into tree forms. There's male and females, and so um, you know, Kathy Smith has done a lot of work on invasive plant management. And if you've got a huge stand of Alanthus, you're gonna wanna go after the females first because they can reproduce and um, be that seed source for next generations. Um, and there's really a good fact sheet on how to manage including um, chemical treatments for um, Alanthus. So you can see here, this is the female, the seeds are starting to form. Um, they actually turn to a really nice, bright kind of pinkish color to a mauve and then finally brown as things progress. They have very um, stout stems and you can see here the buds kind of fit right down there in the, the bud scar themselves. The one thing that we want to point out um, are these little glands on each leaflet. Um, and so it's a, it's a compound leaf um, that can be up to three feet in length. Uh, but this really is kind of a dead giveaway. And so if you're doing monitoring and want to confirm that, yep, I am looking at Alanthus, that's one thing that you can look at. And then also if you're reporting Alanthus um, as part of the project, um, this is the photo that really kind of just puts that nail in the coffin and can help us. Yep, that's it. And we can approve or verify your report um, in the Great Lakes Early Detection network app that we'll talk about here shortly. Again, just a reminder of seeing that collection of the honeydew and the sooty mold and kind of being drawn into those areas. Um, again, it's not going to be spotted lanternfly for sure, uh, but it's definitely one thing that you really want to kind of look and, and do more investigating. So those egg masses uh, that we talked about again are laid late in the fall um, and then will be in that stage till early spring and they can be found on any um, flat surface, whether it's a, a plant or an actual structure. And so we just have to be cautious with those structures or with those things that could be moved that we're not moving this insect any faster or further than what it is naturally. Just going back again, uh, those egg masses are gonna hatch. We're gonna see the nymphs into spring and summer. And then finally the adults will appear. So very large plant hopper, very showy. And again, focusing any kind of monitoring efforts on Alanthus or tree of heaven. Again, we're gonna see those that collection. And so you know, you're hearing this once and twice and three times today, but it really is important on what to look for for signs and symptoms. And so you know, if you see a wasp, you may not think anything of it, but if you're, you're seeing multiple ones collecting and you're seeing this sap run, boy, what do I need to do to look further to make sure that it's not a lanthus or tree of heaven? So again, great cycle. Uh, illustration of the life cycle. Um, and this is a really good piece to get out to other people and share. And so people can then kind of add their friends to start looking and, and add other family members. And it's something that you can do um, and be socially distanced. So you don't have to do it in mass, but you can do it on your own time um, and kind of by yourself or, or with other members of your household. Um, and it'll give you something to do this winter. So at this point, I kind of just want you to think about, okay, so we've talked about life cycle, we've talked about the biology, about this insect, and now let's talk kind of about movement and how this insect is going to get to Ohio or to your county or to your hometown. 
And so this is a great kind of segue into where is spotted lanternfly. And so, you know, we know its native range. Um, and often we kind of, I think, defer to, oh, it's native from China to China, but there are other countries uh, where this insect was known to be or have, has evolved from. It was not in North Korea or Japan. So both of those countries are actually dealing with this as an invasive species, just like we are in the United States. And in fact, um, the infestation in North Korea really kind of started some research that early on is what we um, as, a, as, as folks looked at um, because they were dealing with this in their grape and vineyard um, region. And so they started some research that we could kind of jump on and then continue and grow that research here um, in the United States. So in North America, it was the fall of 2014, there was an active infestation found in southeastern Pennsylvania. That infestation has now been to expand, has been expanded to about 26 counties. Um, and since that original discovery, there's been eight additional states that have reproducing populations or have populations that are, are growing, I should say. And we'll talk about that in just a second. And then additionally, there's states that have found um, some part of the life cycle, but they're not sure that it's continuing or growing. And so um, Michigan was just added to that list, um, I believe last week, where they had a shipment of a dead adult that they found. Um, and it was actually, it's, it's an interesting story. And so it was an industrial area. The shipment actually came from Chicago, but originated in Pennsylvania. And so folks at the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development have reached out to their counterparts in Chicago to do that trace back to make sure that there's nothing in Chicago that's occurring where this shipment kind of made its way from Pennsylvania to Illinois up to Michigan. Here's a, a map of uh, Pennsylvania. And so you can see the, the buff colored counties or the counties where this insect has been for um, a very long time. It's their existing quarantine. In 2020, there was a pretty good expansion of the quarantine, which is the blue areas. And then the darker blue areas within the light blue um, is kind of where that hot spot is. And so where that infested area, uh, but they've gone to quarantining entire counties rather than just that small infested area as they've learned the insect kind of spreads out and is further than what they anticipate usually. And so, you can see here kind of the, the flag was, was uh, flown when, and people were concerned. Um, yes, it's growing, it's expanding, but the two counties that are really near the Ohio line, the Beaver and Allegheny counties, really kind of got our interest in Ohio and began developing a task force, um, had regular meetings with groups and organizations, um, because we knew that it's right there knocking on our door. This is the latest updated map that um, actually is done by New York, um, their integrated pest management. And it's kind of hard to see um, on a screen, I know, um, but there's the spotted lanternfly infestation is present and that's the blue area. When you have a red um, line around that blue area, that's where quarantine lines or boundaries are present. And then you'll notice if we look into Ohio, we've got a blue area, but we don't have a internal state quarantine as of yet. And so um, that's probably gonna be in process as we continue to watch and things develop in Jefferson County. But right now there is not an internal quarantine um, in Ohio. The other thing that I wanna point out, and I just wish the dot was as big as this dot here um, on the screen, it's where individual finds of spotted lanternfly were detected or reported, but there's no infestation present. And so often those were hitchhikers that were found maybe on vehicles 
um, that were transported out of a quarantine into a, a non-quarantined area, but it was just one or the insect wasn't reproducing and there wasn't an egg mass. There are or should be some purple dots in Ohio uh, because we've had similar reports to that, um, but they just aren't showing up. And so we do have just a handful of folks that have reported um, a dead adult, uh, went through the process, ODA confirmed that yes, it was spotted lanternfly. They've done some survey works, but can't find um, any other insects at this time. And so that's kind of where we're at as far as a national perspective of what's happening and where um, spotted lanternfly is. I did mention there was um, some nursery um, stock shipped out to the state of Oregon. Um, there was a dead spotted lanternfly on that, um, that shipment. And there's been also other shipments of non nursery stock uh, where there's been a hitchhiker, but no established population. So when those two counties in Pennsylvania were detected, um, the Ohio Department of Agriculture, which kind of leads the efforts here in the state of Ohio, really put together kind of a proposed area of action or an action area. And they were gonna focus in Northeast Ohio. Um, just because of limited staff and limited dollars and the likelihood of this insect coming in in that area of the state. Um, it's not to say that there wasn't scouting and survey work done in all 88 counties or nearly 88 counties, um, but again their focus was in that, that corner or that region. They also really focused and are focusing on railways and so um, trains that are coming out of infested areas um, and then kind of stopping in Ohio, um, either for loading or unloading or for other purposes where the potential is those egg masses um, or even the adult or the nymphs or adults that have caught a ride can then jump off the train, find infested or find materials or host plants um, to their liking and then become a new isolated infestation. Additionally, they're looking at those transportation hubs beyond rails, including interstates, roads, and highways. And so, you know, just as other invasives um, travel the roads, um, you know, we as humans are carrying the hitchhikers, either knowingly or unknowingly, uh, the same is true with this particular insect. This is um, some survey or some maps that the Department of Agriculture are putting together, which kind of illustrates um, survey work for Alanthus and spotted lanternfly. And so the idea is to look for Alanthus, find Alanthus, look for spotted lanternfly, or at least identify where that Alanthus is that we can then revisit those um, sites in future years. And you can see here, we've got visual um, negative sites. Um, there's some traps that are placed in those areas. And um, so they're really trying to do a good job of getting those traps out across the state, uh, but in areas that make sense where transportation, um, it, it would be key. As we kind of then really drill down, um, the map on the left um, is again, Alanthus and spotted lanternfly surveys. You can see there's some red dots um, along the main road here, the, the orange path. So we've got sur or, um, dots here and then also one here. And those are positive spotted lanternfly adults that were found um, in Jefferson County. Additionally, this map is a little bit of a broader area, but again, showing and focusing where those efforts are, and you can see the red dot here. So they're doing a good job trying to, to map and really show and illustrate where they're looking or where those records are. In addition, we're providing um, data from the Great Lakes Early Detection app, which we're encouraging people to get out and monitor both spotted lanternfly and for spotted lanternfly and Alanthus. And that data then can be added to um, points of survey work. The other thing besides just visual survey, um, Ohio has put up some of these circle traps. 
And so USDA has some, ODA has some, and then there's this how to if you want to build your own circle trap. Um, and so this would be a way to, to build something if you kind of like to be creative, like to build things, and then you would revisit looking at that. Um, you don't really need a trap if you're just revisiting the same trees or looking for um, signs and symptoms of the insect, uh, but some people kind of like that trap um, idea. The other thing is some of the traps um, contain a lure uh, that they're hoping will draw in spotted lanternfly, uh, but there's still research going on um, and the recommendation is you can put up the trap even without the lure, and you can have success if spotted lanternfly are in the area. So we talked a little bit about this before, that the adults don't sting or bite humans, or neither do the nymphs. Um, but I did want to just kind of segue into, especially when we were talking about dogs. Um, so you may have heard, um, this is a great little Halloween costume, so very creative, right? Um, this dog really is maybe just more of a spokesperson uh, raising awareness about spotted lanternfly, but this dog um, is actually trained to look for spotted lanternfly. And so um, this dog is on staff at Penn, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, and she is helping scout for the insect. And if um, we have time, um, at the end, we can come back and we can um, run this um, news story about this particular dog. And so there are a lot of people that are training animals um, as a way to help scout or monitor for spotted lanternfly. All right, so we are on to why should you care? Why should I care about spotted lanternfly? And this photo, um, you know, it really will depend on what your interest or involvement is. And so whether you're a gardener or a homeowner, whether you own a vineyard or an orchard, uh, maybe you have a woodlot that you're um, managing for timber and want the healthiest plants and trees possible. From one to 1000, right? So they can become a nuisance. Um, it just depends on what your tolerance level is um, as a human when it comes to insects. Um, you know, some of you may have a higher tolerance for insects. Um, and you probably know somebody that one spotted lantern fly would be way too much for, for a particular person. So we've got the nuisance factor that we all have to deal with. But we also have the impact that the, the insect has on plants that it's feeding upon. And so again, just being aware, making sure that we're not moving the insect either in the adult stage, the nymph stage or the egg mass stage. Um, I mean, they are hitchhikers. And so we have to be aware of that if we're ever traveling in or through an infested area. And so, you know, that would be true now in Ohio if you're down in Jefferson County. You want to make sure that we're not moving anything, um, but more so if you're going into areas that have high populations, uh, like back in Pennsylvania, that you don't want to bring something home. Pennsylvania is, is trying to do their very best to encourage and engage with residents um, to talk about the quarantine and talk about not spreading the insect. And so they've come up with checklists, which I'm sure as things evolve, we'll have something like this in Ohio when, when numbers um, get larger. They also have a permit system. And so anybody doing business in an infested area has to go through um, the Department of Agriculture's permit system. And so there's classes that they have to take that they're following best management practices um, with all employees. Um, and they have these, these permit holders early on. There's actually millions of permits that are out there. And so um, I'm not sure what Ohio is gonna look like um, as far as the permits and the quarantines. Uh, but raising awareness, knowing what to look for, and again, trying to do our best to not spread this insect in other counties or other states is, is so important. 
So, you know, when we talk about caring, uh, this is something that could impact every one of us, either on a home scale or commercially. Um, and so we just need to be aware and kind of watch the story as it evolves and, and how it's gonna impact our lives and what we do. So the next question is pretty logical about what you can do. And so additional trainings like this, staying updated with new maps, um, the new research that's evolving and we're, things that we're learning as time goes on, um, sharing printed information or on social media. Uh, this is a great pest alert. It's kind of that intro to life cycle biology damage. What can you do kind of information? ask the questions. And so hopefully you've got some questions that you're thinking through of how is this gonna impact me? Or what about this? That we can have some really good discussion at the end of the presentation. Some of those questions that you may pose um, or that people pose, we don't have answers for. And so we're still learning or that information is evolving. And so just think of, you know, being introduced to something that you really don't have any history with or knowledge of and all the things that need to be learned about that. And so from life cycle to behavior, um, insecticide treatments. And so there are some really good insecticide treatments that um, can control this insect. Um, and so concern, just a, just a, do a little kind of soapbox, uh, whenever we really talk about and raise awareness about pests. Um, sometimes people are like, oh man, I could make a buck on that. And so we've seen it with emerald ash borer, we've seen it with Asian longhorn beetle where unfortunately people will go door to door and say, hey, I, I can you know, save your trees or protect your trees from this insect. At this point, um, the Department of Agriculture is considering insecticide treatments in that known um, area where we found spotted lanternfly in Jefferson County, but there's no need to do treatments um, for spotted lanternfly if you don't have spotted lanternfly, right? And so um, you've got to have an insect there that you can treat. Um, and so there's nothing that they can treat that's going to avoid yourself of the insect. And so make sure that you don't fall prey to anybody saying or claiming that they'll take care of spotted lanternfly um, before it even arrives. Lots of research on host preferences and observations. And so it seems like every time I talk to somebody else in Pennsylvania, they're like, oh, you know what? We saw it feeding on this, or we, we saw the insect on this plant. And so um, really expanding and then doing that replicated research to see what really is their preference. What is their porterhouse steak compared to their Hamburg um, as it relates to what foods that they like. There was some thought early on that the insect had to feed on Alanthus to complete its life cycle. They've done some, some work and have learned that they can um, mate and reproduce uh, while feeding on plants other than Alanthus. It really slows the development down um, and the overall health and vigor of the insect, um, but they can make it uh, without Alanthus. Of course, there's really, they're doing a lot with monitoring and detection efforts, um, trying to expand those into other areas, make them friendly enough that citizen science can, scientists can help with those efforts. There's not enough employees to, to really take on spotted lanternfly. So encouraging engaging the industry and the, the public to be part of that is really important. And then of course, um, biological controls. And often, you know, this is met with a lot of excitement that, oh, what can we do to biologically control this, this pest? Um, and obviously there are some concerns, right? And so that's why they have to do research in the lab. So not out in nature to make sure that what's gonna be the consequence if we introduce a biological control from the native range to the United States. I mean, are there gonna be other off target um, impacts? And although it sounds good, right? 
Um, often there are some issues related to biocontrols. Um, good news is sometimes they're out in the field and they see a decline in the population naturally. So nothing was introduced. And so trying to figure out that dynamic and what caused that decline. And then is that something that could be reproduced and done on a larger scale? So a lot of research going on, a um, lot of updates in, the, in that area. Additionally, um, you know, there's signs and ID cards, and these are ways that you can get the information out to the masses. And so if you don't have your own spotted lanternfly ID card, uh, let us know and we'll get those to you. Um, I, I kind of jokingly say we're card carrying members of the SLF club. And so um, I always have a few in my wallet and make sure that I'm passing out and distributing those to, to other people to again, engage and get more people looking. Uh, Maria and Thomas have done a really great job of working with uh, vineyard owners to get some signage and additional ID cards out to their locations where the public is in and out. And again, just raising awareness. Um, if you have not checked out the Ohio Department of Agriculture's website, I would highly recommend it. Um, this is their latest um, media release um, about the new find in Jefferson County. Um, and so there's photos, there's information about the insect, um, often referring back to resources in Pennsylvania and other states that have had the insect. Um, we also share that information on our Buckeye Yard and Garden line. And so if you um, are new to the Beagle, as like we like to call it, um, it's bygl.osu.edu. Um, you can actually go in and where it says alerts, you can sign up for an email when there are new alerts. And we definitely will add information about spotted lanternfly as it becomes available. So a nice go-to resource. These are just some articles that recently appeared in Beagle. And so um, there's some Penn State scientists that are trying to examine the potential for birds to eat spotted lanternfly. And so they're encouraging citizen scientists to this winter um, and really all season long, uh, watch bird activity, are, are they, um, you know, going after egg masses? Are they, they pecking around to do that? Are they eating the nymphs or the adults? And then recording that information. And so really just trying to, to kind of um, get the word out to see what's happening. What are those local observations? Um, Ashley Kulhanek um, uh, authored a fact sheet that's really some good information. Um, so just, you know, updates as, as things develop. And so this would be a good resource to, to be part of. I've talked about the website for a while um, and it's almost there, um, but this is gonna be kind of Ohio State's go-to place. Um, again, kind of referencing um, kind of a blog format with any updates, links to maps and resources, questions on if you want to monitor, how, do you be, how can you be part of that? And so stay tuned to, to spot the spot. And then I always plug invasive.org as one of my favorite websites um, to learn more about spotted lanternfly, but any invasive species. So uh, when you can't sleep some night, um, check out this website and you'll get lots of information about what's happening in the world of invasives. What I wanna do now though is, um, you know, I've encouraged people to be, to, to look for spotted lanternfly um, and wanna talk about the reporting options. And so know that in Ohio, Ohio Department of Agriculture is the go-to. And so you can go to them directly by calling, emailing, or um, going online and making a report. And I'll show that in just a second. Um, the Great Lakes Early Detection app, which we've done, um, you know, in services and, and videos um, and PowerPoints about how to use the app, how to report all invasive species. Uh, what I really like about the Great Lakes Early Detection app is that you can report what you're seeing, 
but there's also a function of negative reports that I'll cover in just a second. If you have a personal relationship with your extension educator, you know them by first name, you have conversations, you know, if you see something out in the field and gosh, is that what it is? Give them a call, but know that that report, um, what you're seeing, again, has got to go through ODA. And then the same would be true if you've got a service forester or an urban forester that you've got a great relationship with and you, you think you're seeing something, want to get some more information, uh, they could be that point of contact. But all suspect reports ultimately are directed to ODA and then the ver verification of that insect is done through USDA. So let's take a look at the ODA website. Um, know that when I showed you that site, there's kind of the general information button here. And so that would be information about the insect. It would be links to other places to go um, to learn about this. There's the, the pest alert fact sheet that you can download and read. But the other tab is to report a suspect infestation. So you can do this right online. And what ODA is asking for is the date of the submission, your name, your phone number and email, and that's simply so they can reach out and, and contact you for additional information, where the address is, um, and this can be challenging, right? So if it's at your house that has a house number and a street, that's pretty easy. Uh, but just recently, there was a hunter um, out in one of the um, state forests who saw a spotted lanternfly adult on his tree stand. And so he was, um, you know, that's a little bit more difficult to really kind of zoom down on where that actual location is. They also, um, there's a drop down for your county and then the property type. So is it a private property? Is it commercial? Is it a transportation route? So near um, tracks, near a road. There's a list for plant host and habitat. So where that insect was feeding. The specimen life stage, again, another drop down. So did you see an egg mass, a nymph or the adult? And then was there a specimen collected? Yes or no? And so, if you have a specimen, you know, grab it and get it contained. Take a photo. Um, you can list any other comments that would be helpful. Um, and then what they really need though in this initial report is that photo. Um, and so that really helps them make sure that they're not kind of chasing different things or gosh, you know, a month ago, I think I saw it, so I better do a report. Um, getting that photo and, and collecting that specimen is really important for verification. So that's the ODA website. The other thing that I had mentioned was the Great Lakes Early Detection app. Um, hopefully there are a lot of folks out there that have the app and are using the app. Um, and there's, if you're not familiar with it, there's a lot of good information to, to kind of get you started and get you that information. Just a couple real um, screenshots. I wanted to show you that negative survey that I mentioned. So if you are a person that, hey, I can do this. I, this is interesting to me. I'm gonna go out and visit designated spots in my town or my county. Um, but we wanna know that you're doing that. So you know it might have gone unnoticed, right? If you're not seeing spotted lanternfly. But in this case, we'll know that you're out in the field and we know that you're out there and maybe can help in another area. Um, and so you could do the negative survey or if you're doing it off based off of spotted la or Alanthus, you can report that tree in the app. And so you can see here, you can go into trees. There's lots of good information. I claim that the, the app is a great resource or educational tool as well. So great photos, great descriptions. Um, you'd actually need to log into this EDD map. So that's in addition to the Great Lakes Early Detection Network with your own username and passcode. And then you're gonna make that report. And so this is an example of actually a report on Oriental Bittersweet. 
uh, but it has the Latin longs. It's got the information. You can add comments that you find are helpful. If it's a single point or if you found a large infestation, you can kind of draw an area of how big that was. Um, and then just a, a quick reminder, um, even if you're using it now to go in and upload those queued messages or they kind of just sit there. And so I know I was out in the field doing some reporting. I told Kathy, hey, I've got some reports. And she's like, well, I don't see them um, as a verifier. And so I had forgotten to go, on, go in and, and hit that upload those queued messages. And so once they're verified, um, you know, if it's Atlantis and we can verify it by the photos, um, it becomes a, a red dot on the map. If it's um, spotted lanternfly, then that's going to go through that procedure through ODA and USDA, but ultimately then uh, once verified becomes also a red dot. And so finally, um, we've got about, oh, 45 minutes to kind of talk about, um, you know, a panel discussion. What are your questions? Um, hopefully get some answers. And then if we have time, we can go back and see that, that video clip of um, Pennsylvania doing some training with the, the, the dogs. And so with that, I am going to stop sharing. So everybody can see some faces. Looks like we've got some questions that have already started. So you want me to go through them for you, Amy? Sure. Maria showing her ID card. <laughs> card carrying. <laughs> awesome. Um, so our first question is from Judith, and she wants to know how large are the various instar stages. All right. So anybody, does anybody want to, they've heard me talk for a while, or I mean, I can answer it too. Go ahead, Amy. <laughs> You're it, buddy. Don't so, all jump at once. <laughs> so, you know, first instar is going to be really pretty small. So, you know, gosh, is it a quarter of an inch? Would that be fair to say? Um, and then as each stage or instar, they're going to get a little bit larger. They're much smaller in comparison than the adult, which is important to know. Um, so much smaller than the adults, but starting out pretty small. Okay. Christine wants to know, do uncovered egg masses survive? Okay, so I, I, I want to give everybody else a Your chance. Your panel's quiet. <laughs> Maria, do you have anything to add or to? Um, I believe most of them can, especially if it's a pretty mild winter and they haven't been sprayed with insecticide. But obviously, if anybody, say like PDA or ODA are treating those egg masses, they'll be easier to, to kill via insecticide. Okay. Uh, Jason asks, do we have growing degree days for egg hatch yet? There is that information from Pennsylvania, yes. And so those observations have been made and they continue to kind of document that through the years. Um, so there's a website that we can share uh, that has that information. Um, and what USDA was doing earlier in the season is they were taking screenshots of the maps of where the growing degrade units were, our accumulations were, and they were actually predicting egg hatch and then also um, development of those instar or instars or stages. Okay. Rick asks, how high up the tree will most egg masses be located? So I will share, um, I was on a call that Dave Atkins was reporting, reporting what they were seeing in Jefferson County and somebody who was in 
the infestation and has had years of experience uh, because they did not find any egg masses in Ohio, which is good news, right? And the person in Pennsylvania was like, well, did you, you didn't look up high enough. And Dave was like, well, we looked really hard. We had binoculars. They were actually folks from Pennsylvania and other states that came over to help with the initial survey work. Uh, but they made the point that egg masses can be laid really high into the canopy and can be difficult to see. So some of the photos that I used in this PowerPoint and that others have used, you know, sometimes show those egg masses down low and in real obvious spots, um, which can happen, uh, but they can also be very high and maybe kind of be disguised a little bit as well. And Amy, that's, um, you brought up a good point. Uh, if anyone's out scouting, uh, Tree of Heaven's not necessarily at eye height where you can actually see everything. So taking out a good pair of binoculars to scout higher up, we found that that was pretty effective for seeing what was going on in the canopy. Were there any other tips or hints, Erica? I know, cause you were out doing some scouting with the folks from infested areas. Yeah, so one of the things that we had a, some challenges with is maybe not necessarily the eggs that are laid on trees, but the ones that are laid on rail cars, something that we noticed uh, from one of the trains that was going through the area, it had a lot of mud um, on the underside that kind of resembled egg masses, but they were actually spots of mud. So sometimes detection is really difficult. Uh, so I would say um, check your vehicles, especially um, for here, we have a lot of folks traveling to the Pittsburgh area. So I like to always tell them, make sure you're checking your vehicles for any of the life stages. Okay. Uh, what practices are put into place when a county or area is put under quarantine? So in general terms, when we talk about quarantine, um, I mean, the purpose of a quarantine is to restrict the movement outside of that infested area. And so, um, like Thomas works really closely with the nursery industry. And so a quarantine put in place, whether it be for spotted lanternfly or for another invasive would be to, to limit the movement or potential spread. And so they would have to do something to ensure that that product, that what they're trying to move out um, is pest free. And so often that includes um, you know, a visitor from the Department of Agriculture to make sure uh, that it's pest free. Um, it could include the treatment of an insecticide. Um, and so there's different things. Um, I have a, a niece that works uh, with in medical equipment. And you're probably like, where is she going with this? But they <laughs> receive a lot of shipments, um, of course, of this medical equipment. And she was talking to one of the the delivery um, drivers and they, uh, it was FedEx, you know, throughout the company have really been trying to increase awareness about this insect and other insects that could be moved. And so, um, you know, in the Pennsylvania area, those trucks are being washed on a regular basis, especially as they're leaving a quarantine to make sure that they're not spreading the insect. So that would be some of the things as it relates to a, to a quarantine. So Amy, I can chime in a little bit too. So we have a couple of guys with the truck out of Pennsylvania. We have a, the, the problem is we have a lot of nursery stock that comes from all over the place. And initially we were really hopped up, no pun intended, on the whole, you know, checking for tree of heaven among the grapes and all that kind of stuff. But we had a shipment of trees that came in from Pennsylvania from a quarantined area and they, they found 10 dead, um, spot a lantern fly actually on the tree. So the, in order for them to ship out of quarantine areas, they're supposed to be treating those. And they obviously treated these trees for that. But the concern that I would have is that, um, you know, we're, we need to be looking not only for insects, but also for egg masses with, especially nursery stock coming in, coming into, um, 
you know, like Ashtabula County, because I think that's really where we may see the first infestation happen. But that um, the other thing is trucks to truck out of that truck through Pennsylvania or quarantined area. If they stop in there, they are required to be um, registered and licensed to be able to truck out of that. And with that comes um, there needs to be a visual inspection of the truck before they leave the quarantine area to make sure there are no adults or uh, nymphs or egg masses on there or the best of their ability. So. Raymond asks, how detrimental is this pest to grapevines in the wine industry? I'll Maria. let Maria take Maria. Yeah, Maria, this is your, <laughs> this is your baby, buddy. The answer is berry. Um, so it turns out at least for as far as fruit crops go that grapes are a highly preferred host after the Islandus tree of heaven. Um, and at least from what we know in Pennsylvania, several acres of grapevines have been taken out as a result of this insect. And as Amy has explained, it's primarily because it's a phloem sap feeder insect. So what we speculate is happening from at least a plant physiology perspective is that these insects are basically bleeding the vine dry in the, um, in the sense that it really can, in large enough numbers of feeding, can stunt the vine growth um, during the season, but more importantly, weaken its ability to acclimate to winter temperatures. And ultimately, at least as far as Pennsylvania and Ohio are concerned, we kind of live on the edge um, in terms of viticulture for what we can grow uh, winter hardiness wise in this state. And so if there's any sort of margin for error when it comes to um, winter cold hardiness, those vines can, usually be killed off as a result of their weakened state um, in terms of their ability to, to withstand a, a cold temperature event, um, such as like the polar vortex that we had in 2019, 2014, 2015. Uh, so that's really why these vines are dying back and why it's such a concern. And we also still don't know sort of what the threshold of that feeding habit happens to be for the vines themselves. Um, but if you think about it, it makes sense because relative to trees, um, vine trunks are often regenerated they tend to be much smaller than tree trunks. Um, and so it takes a lot less um, for those vines uh, to be to, to die back as a result of the feeding um, from these insects. That's why we're so concerned about it um, getting into Ohio and more importantly, getting into that Northeast region where Tom is at, um, because that's where the concentration of our major vineyard acreage happens to be. So Maria, I'm gonna prime you a little bit, but the, um, so pretty much they look at that minus 10 degrees as being a threshold where they're going to start to lose, um, to actually lose grape production for the next year. But right. what you're saying is based on, you know, if there's a uh, spinal lantern fly damage, that temperature may not be minus 10, it could be zero, it could be plus five, five. And that's, yeah. 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 And we think of it as absolutes, right? Not necessarily wind chill, but absolute temperature. So, you know, you might think, oh, it's only minus 11 for a couple of hours, but that's really all it takes if that threshold for survivorship of the primary bud, which is where all the grapes are produced on, um, is say minus 10 or minus nine. So it really is like a threshold game of margins numbers. And anything that we can do to increase that is, is gonna be helpful. But this this fly, when it's like, yeah, as Tom, Tom said, if it's zero or minus five instead of minus 10, well, that's a big problem. Okay. Um, Marcus asks, do we know how it started in Pennsylvania? Probably as a baby. Actually there at the time it was introduced. <laughs> <laughs> I figured it, you know, I had a little levity to it. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, I actually started my grad program in viticulture at Penn State and State College, Pennsylvania in 2014 when this insect was introduced. Um, so from my recollection from their um, previous entomologist, Mike San uh, Saunders, who was um, there giving a talk at, a, at the Mid-Atlantic Fruit and Vegetable Convention, it was introduced on some like paver stones or some landscaping material um, into southeastern Pennsylvania. But the problem happened to be is uh, that fly didn't actually die, or the egg mass, I should say, didn't die back during the polar vortex event. And that's when we all started to get really worried about it because that event was what, minus 20 or something like that. So if that egg mass could survive that cold, we knew that that, that population was just gonna grow. So um, that's how it was introduced. It was minus 30 up here, by the way. It was oh, interesting, yeah, but I remember, I remember <laughs> so, you, <Tom. laughs> so I'll give Tim Brotsman credit for this, but we had 
the year after the polar vortex, we had a 73 degree event and it was minus 33 for the polar vortex. It was a hundred degree differential within the state of Ohio in that one, you know, in that one calendar year. So I thought it was a fun fact. That's a cool fact. It is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Christine asks, are there spotted lanternfly lookalikes that appear at approximately the same time? So the, um, you know, the resource that um, Virginia had that I shared in the PowerPoint, um, I would have to look at the life cycle of each of those insects. Um, I mean, I'm familiar with the Alanthus webworm or the, um, it's the Alanthus webworm that was there. Yeah. Um, and that would overlap. Um, I think that they probably chose insects that would look similar, but then also um, would have that similar time frame um, to to really have part of that be confused. Okay, that's a good question. I'll have to now do the life cycle history of each of those <laughs> insects and then map it out to see what overlap. So, Amy, I just pulled it up, but. Um, if you look, and again, there's a really good um, visual on the uh, University of Virginia website, but um, things like tiger moth can look a little bit alike, oak tree hopper, buck moth, leopard moth, but uh, Ilanthus wedworm. But I think the thing is, and it was interesting, we had a, I had a call this week and I went out and the guy says, I think I have spotted lanternfly. He saw your Smithsonian Magazine article. And what actually, what he was saying is he thought he saw the nymph but it's the wrong time of year for a nymph. So if you saw anything, it would be a, you know, a, a spotted lanternfly adult. So it was probably, we think it might've been like a milkweed bug or something like that. But um, again, it's when you start to look at the life cycle right now, we should be seeing adults or eggs. Okay. Uh, next one is Lee asks, will the waxy coating on the egg masses fully protect those eggs from damage during extended periods of negative temperature regimes in the winter? You know, I think so. And I think um, Maria mentioned it earlier, even those exposed eggs, um, I mean, they don't have to be covered. Um, and so, you know, it's, these insects are, have adapted and, can withstand these cold temperatures to survive. And so, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, we've been on the receiving end of those really cold temperatures recently and this insect just continues to, to survive. So Lee also asks, realizing that Alanthus is also prevalent throughout European countries, are they too having problems dealing with spotted lanternfly? We hear so much about the issues in the U.S., but nothing from potential problems in other parts of the world. I'm not aware of it being an issue in Europe. Um, I don't know if that's because there are more geographical barriers they have to cross. Like you have the Mediterranean Sea, you have deserts, you have um, very tall mountains, mountain regions with the Ural Mountains. So I don't know, I, I don't, I, as far as I'm aware, it's not an issue there, but um, certainly if any of you know anything more about that. I haven't heard anything for Europe. Uh, okay, so Kathleen says, are you reaching out to all vineyard owners and orchard owners? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like um, Extension has the Beagle website. We have a grape website as well. It's go.osu.edu slash grapes. Um, we have all of the OSD fact sheets and USDA fact sheets on that insect. We also put out um, uh, a blog series to a 700, 800 person listserv. Um, that goes out to our industry, both locally and multi-state. So yeah, um, we have a major conference event coming up in February where we are excited to be hosting um, the lead for vineyard research and extension out of Penn State who will be there to discuss management issues with um, grape growers and how they can tackle that. 
Um, of course, Tom, Amy, and everybody else who's been on that team has been um, very helpful with the extension materials for our industry. So yes, absolutely. I can't speak on behalf of hops and apples and other crops, but I, I believe they're likely doing the same. Yeah, so, when we found it in Jefferson, uh, I immediately sent out a letter to the vineyards in the area. Of course, we only have a few. It's not like Northeastern Ohio, so that wasn't a problem here. But we, do, we did try to get in touch with them. So actually, Maria came up with a really good idea because um, the goal was to get the, so this is the brochure, and Amy actually got these for us. It's an eight and a half by 11, and it's got a little holder for the cards in it, but this is so Maria was kind of like, yeah, you put a 18 by 24 poster right where they're buying their wine. That's probably not going to go real well. So what we came up with was this small little, you know, small little holder that uh, people can take a card. And the goal is, and again, Amy kind of referred to this, is the goal is to try to get as many eyes looking in as many different places for this insect. And the cards are a great way to do this. So uh, I mean, obviously, um, people that are going to vineyards have a vested interest to protect the vines. I'm a big believer in that. So um, they're probably more inclined to uh, be active supporters of, of searching for this. Um, so, yeah, that was but it was a good idea because we didn't think about that. But the idea of putting a big bug right next to the cash register probably wasn't a good <laughs> idea. So good job, Maria. Oh, and one so other thing is we're also a lot of time talking to the media. So Amy, Erica, and I also just gave um, some uh, a media article review to to CFAES News and a local news outlet. So yeah, we're spending a lot of time talking to the public. I will add that um, a group of us got an ACER grant um, to work on some maple research, and we did put a chunk of money in there to do that very same thing for all the maple producers that have outlets where they sell material. So the a little sign is there with a card. Since the maples are part of the list of species that certain sections of the pest tend to feed on. So that will go into effect. I think we get the money that, for that next year. So we'll add that to the list. Um, Elizabeth asked, do we know if spotted lanternfly vectors any plant viruses or diseases? So they have not found that um, because obviously some plant hoppers are known to do that. Um, the, the research will continue, uh, but at this point um, that does not look like something that's happening um, currently. Really good question. Is there a better list of native and exotic host species, preferably by preference? Um, so Penn State does have a, a resource list. Um, and of course it ranks them, how kind of we've talked about the Alanthus tree of heaven, number one, grapes number two, it kind of works its way down. But then there's this kind of list that people just have observed the insect um, on and so kind of that the, this whole bucket list, right? Um, I would suggest taking a look at that list. Know though that it's kind of still evolving. And so just the other day, somebody said, Hey, I noticed them. And there was some questions. So are they just on the plant, kind of just hanging out, or are they actively feeding? And so we've got to make sure that. You no, know, it wasn't just a casual observation of the insect there, but it was not feeding, and then it makes it onto this feeding list. Um, yeah, there was a study that looked at the gut contents of spotted lanternfly nymphs, and they found that the plants that they were on were not necessarily the ones they were feeding on. They actually were feeding on mostly alianthus and grape. Good. Okay. Um, Emily asks, is there any kind of effort being made to remove or ask people to remove Tree of Heaven? Yeah. So <laughs> I, I can actually answer this as well. So one of the things that right now we're not removing Tree of Heaven up in Lake County. So I don't, am I allowed to share my screen, Kathy? Yeah, you should be able to. Um, yeah, uh, hold on. that's up to so, Marty. Yep, your host. Uh, so can you guys see that or no? Mm -hmm. Not yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hold on. 
me make sure I'm sharing my screen. Sharing my screen. All right, anyways. Um, let me see where it is. I don't see my Excel file. Anyways, the Excel file that I have, I'll, I'll look for it and then we can pull it up. But the goal is the, um, we have uh, like 15 trees that my master gardeners are adopting in Lake County. And um, so basically the goal is for them to once a week visit the tree. And I actually put a, um, we did a real quick video, Andrew Holden and I, on uh, how to load the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app to your phone. So that's in the chat box if you guys are interested in doing that. But um, basically the goal is that they are going to look at these trees once a week and then they are going to, um, uh, they are going to um, then report that to the uh, Great Lakes Early Detection Network app as a negative find. And then Amy will get the negative finds on the spot of lantern fly and Kathy will get the pop positive finds on the tree of heaven. So the goal is to kind of use the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app as a clearinghouse to kind of get um, the information out. But the goal right now in Lake County is to kind of keep the tree of heaven. But then again, Erica, you have a lot more down at Southern Ohio than we do up in uh, Northeastern Ohio. So for, for us, we're going to use it as, as kind of a trap tree. And there has been some research on, you know, do you treat tree of heaven with an insecticide? and let the insect feed on that systemically to kill some insects. But that still is, I think, being researched. But um, yeah, with Don and Erica, you might want to talk about that. Up in Lake County, we're keeping them because we want to we want to try to use them as a, as a trap tree. But what do you think, Erica? Yeah, around here, there's just so many. Um, one of our service foresters actually made the comment, you, you cut down one and a million more show up to the funeral. Um, yep. So is, it's more of a question of, is it feasible to get rid of them? Um, not always. <laughs> uh, but of course, we have a lot of potential prime feeding ground for spotted lanternfly here. There are good ways to kill them, and there are bad ways to kill them. <laughs> they can be killed. Um, well, actually, okay. Kathy, so, that's a yeah. good you brought, you brought to mind a really good point because a lot of times if you if you cut one and that's all you're going to have a lot of babies right so maybe talk about that right right no i mean it's if you girdle if you try to kill the lanthus by girdling you're just going to as erica stated the statement is you kill the adult and a thousand show up for its funeral and so what was one tree you were trying to kill you now have a thousand to kill so um, girdling is not one of the methods we recommend, but there are some other options depending on the size of the tree um, that are very effective. But again, um, it may be something that takes multiple shots because it's a tough one to kill. Um, so yeah, Yen only asks this if insect you... would kill a lanthus. <laughs> That's what we all were hoping for when we first heard about it. It was like, yes. And that was like, nah. <laughs> um, Yen asks, if you found an egg mass and collected it, what do you do with it? So at that point, probably the easiest thing would be to contact the Department of Agriculture. Um, either email, call, or you could use their online system. Um, you could take a photo of what you have, um, but then what they'll probably request is that you mail or get that egg mass to them um, or one of their um, personnel that's in the area could have, you know, make that connection with you. But yeah, they would need to get that so they can verify that, yep, that is indeed um, the egg mass for spotted lantern fly. So that's a really good question. And one of the things we find is like, so somebody might say, oh, egg mass, I'm going to scrape it off if they would take a picture before they scrape it off, or if they take a picture of the adult before they, then a lot of times it's a lot easier to identify that than, you know, basically the, uh, like a pile of arms and legs. So the, and wings. So the goal is if they snap a quick pick with their phone and then, you know, and then basically capture the insect or kill it, that really is a helpful thing. It's a, it's, it's easier to, identify 
a live bug as a whole as opposed to pieces parts. Would you agree, Amy? Yes. <laughs> um, one thing I would add to that is actually, I think the preference should be to call ODA first because after that press release they made, their website actually had crashed for the spotted lanternfly reporting system for like 24 to 48 hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Darlene asks, have you asked OCVN groups to do some searching? What about articles to various hiking and birding groups to inform and do some searching? Assume arboretums are watching. Those are all great um, outreach ideas. Um, I think the OCVN has probably been like county by county, um, but definitely something to, to get the word out kind of in a mass communication and, and I can work with Ann Barrett on that because um, you're exactly right it's the people that are out in nature that um, hey that's just one more thing that they can look at or at least if they're armed with what to see if they see something that hey they suspect it um, they can let people know okay Darlene also asked, Amy, do you give talks to other groups? <laughs> we all give talks on Spotted Lantern Fly. So. <laughs> okay. Um, so Kathleen asked, can we get the fact sheet slash card holder for our nature center in Lake County? Say again. Can they get the the card holder that you guys were showing that you got at the wine places, can they get one for their nature center in Lake County? Absolutely. Tell them to get a hold of me. The has that too. My name's spelled wrong, but it's D-E-H-A-A-S. Although other people would say that that's probably more appropriate spelling. So, but <laughs> D-E-H-A-A-S -E dot two at OSU dot edu. They can, or they can call me. Okay. Got extras. Thanks to Amy. Cool. Um, and there is Kathleen asked, can I get Tom's email address? So, and Marnie put it in the chat box. Um, Emily started one. I should have mentioned it. I'm in Southwest Ohio regarding the tree of heaven. So it doesn't really matter. I think where in Ohio you are, um, the approach from a forester's perspective is to get rid of tree of heaven. I mean, it's one of those nasties that we want out of our forests. So I, the approach is pretty much statewide in that case that we want them to go. <laughs> One shape, form, however, go. <laughs> we want to get rid of them. So um, like I said, I was excited when I heard it would feed on um, Tree of Heaven. And then when Amy and I were talking and also porcelain berry, which is in the grapevine or the Vetus uh, group. And so porcelain berry is another non-native invasive that they could feed on all they want. Um, but of course they don't listen to us. <laughs> so that's all the questions I see in the Q and A box. Any other questions? I typed in uh, Tom's address wrong. So give me a second, I'm fixing it. <laughs> uh, I wanna know how it's spelt wrong on his own Yes, I honestly somebody typed that because I I didn't put that in my. Uh, uh -huh. that might have been, I was I was on a webinar last night, so somebody spelled it wrong. But uh, right. it's, it's correct. So anyways, <laughs> hey, I, well, you guys are all laughing. I did have a spotted lanternfly joke. You know where spotted uh -oh. lanternflies get their music? Spotify. Uh. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> All right, I'm going to yeah, stop I want to give a shout out though to the public um, because every um, call, email, concern has been, it has come from the public. And so whether it's an individual who traveled to Pennsylvania and came back to Ohio and the next day saw a spotted lanternfly adult I mean, they captured, killed, and got that to ODA. It was the truck driver that was traveling through um, that saw a spotted lantern fly on a gas pump. 
Um, there was one, a story that the spotted lanternfly was in the truck of the cab that made its way from Pennsylvania up to Lorain County. And so, you know, people are paying attention um, and that's wonderful. So ODA can quickly re uh, respond to those fines and, and try to figure out how established or if it's been established. And so um, I know we just have a little bit of time and I don't know, Erica, is there anything that you would wanna share about the situation in Jefferson County specifically? And I know that came from somebody at the general public finding yeah. it. It was really, um, well, it was good timing. We had actually had a spotted lanternfly presentation the night before, uh, and then I got a Facebook message. Um, it was actually one of our 4-H um, advisors or a family member uh, who had seen some of our advertising um, on that and had contacted ODA. Um, I think actually it was his friend that initially found it and wanted to use it as a fishing lure. Um, but he caught him before he did that, <laughs> so, um, which actually after he met, mentioned that, I thought, hmm, that actually would be a nice fishing lure, but, <laughs> um, yeah, that's, so I can't emphasize enough how important the role of volunteers are in citizen science in detecting this insect. Um, around here, we had, um, we were looking especially close to rail lines, um, if you're familiar with this area of Ohio, we have quite a few rail cars that run uh, north to south uh, along the Ohio River, but we also, uh, in Jefferson County, we have a landfill that gets their trash from uh, New Jersey. So we have a trash train that comes through uh, those quarantined areas. So that's a potential um, concern that we have. So that's where we were focusing. And uh, Mingo Junction, where those adults were found uh, we're close to those rail lines, so um, yeah, train travel uh, along with uh, really vehicles, we think are going to be the main thing that spread them. Okay. Ornie, if you'll stop recording, I'll share the 